Uh, hi guys, this is the third presentation for um, Unit 306. And we're looking at hydraulics, uh, plant preventative maintenance and troubleshooting. And uh, the units we're covering, are, or the criteria covered are 1.9, 1.11, 1.12, 113, 114, 115, 2 .1, 2 .2, 2 .6, 3 .2, 3 .3, 2.1, 2.2, 2.6, 3.2, 3.3, and 3.6. Okay, just to reiterate, some of the um, some of the units are not f some of the criteria are not fully covered, but we just uh, we just feed into those criteria. So, uh, like if you upload stuff on one file, you should have a little bit of additional information on those units as well of uh, what's being covered in class. Okay, uh, the, the other two presentations are available online as well. So um, check your emails, you've got the links, and um, uh, if you want to refer to them. So we, we're looking at, or we, we were looking at schematics, um, hydraulic schematics and symbols, as well as uh, the whole aspect of health and safety and what can go wrong if you work on hydraulic systems. Okay, let's make a, let's make a start. So um, first one. Okay, at the end of the session, you will be uh, understanding the causes of contamination in hydraulic systems. Yeah, just to reiterate a little bit, um, some um, analysts think that somewhere between 80 and 90 percent of all faults in hydraulic systems are down to uh, contaminants in, um, in hydraulics, in the oil. And we're going to look a little bit closer what this all entails uh, throughout this presentation. So we're going to spend quite a bit of time on this since this is uh, the biggest factor in downtime uh, of hydraulic systems. Uh, you will know of common system faults. So we're going to look at those as well. And it's not that hard to sort of try and identify them and see what's happening. Uh, you'll be able to explain the need for safe isolation. Okay, when if you did the health and safety session, um, you will be aware of um, the uh, whole aspect of uh, safe isolation and, and um, you know, the, the things which can go wrong in hydraulics. And it's important that uh, you understand safe isolation. Okay, if you don't do this, if you don't isolate uh, an hydraulic system, you start working on it, uh, it can become very dangerous very quickly. And uh, you will be able to explain procedures uh, to release stored energy. Uh, again, we're looking at hydraulic systems, we're looking at release valves, uh, and um, you need to obviously get your head around it. It's very, very important before you start any work on hydraulic systems. So that's what we are covering in this unit for the next hour. Okay, the next slide. What are the common causes uh, for hydraulic systems to fail? I'm going to give you a moment to try and come up with some answers. What are common causes for hydraulic systems to fail? I'm going to give you 30 seconds uh, if you can take some mental notes or write it down. Go for it. Okay, um, could you think of some, some causes for hydraulic systems to fail? Um, we talked a little, little bit before how an hydraulic system worked, and that, that was sort of in the last presentation. And uh, I think the biggest one obviously is a pump. If the pump fails, you can't generate pressure. If there's no pressure, there's no flow. Uh, and hence, nothing in your hydraulic system is gonna, gonna work. Yeah, and obviously then you've got your actuators, you've got your valves, your motors, your pistons. So they can fail as well. Um, let's have a look. Go to the next slide and see what we what we have. So we've got number one is is obviously is um, is wear and tear. So it's mechanical parts. Um, most hydraulic parts they they've got a, a designed lifespan. So if you if you look at the data sheets, you will get some information about uh, how many hours um, a certain part is expected to work. And, um, and obviously it depends on the quality as well, the quality of the material. But there are many other factors in hydraulic systems as well. One of them we, we already mentioned, which is uh, the whole issue of contamination. So if contamination kicks in, um, your wear and tear is going to pro progress a lot faster. 
and you've got an accumulative effect. So that means if um, you get some tiny substances, some tiny particles which come off, let's say, a valve or an hydraulic motor, and they sort of swim in the oil and float in the oil and they're not picked up by a filter, um, they will cause more abrasion and uh, more bits and pieces are going to be shaved off um, the uh, actuators, the pump, um, the valves, and, uh, and you've got an accumulative effect. So the system's going to go down a lot faster than you think. Uh, we've got leaks, which is a big issue. So leaks, uh, again, actuators, pipes, and joints. And, and that is sort of a big thing uh, in hydraulics where leaks can be very dangerous. Yeah. You always have to bear in mind that an hydraulic system can operate using a very high pressure. Uh, average pressure is about 10 bars, can go up to about 100 bars or even more. And uh, if you've got a leak, you can get um, these jets coming out of your pipe or a joint or wherever they may come out of, or broken actuator, and uh, they can lead to oil injection injury, which again we talked about in our first session is, is very, very dangerous and can lead to amputation. So you have to be um, very careful when you, when you look at hydraulic systems and have a, a good amount of respect. Um, we have got um, um, pipes and joints. We talked about this contamination of hydraulic fluid. We talked about that water ingress into the hydraulic fluid. Okay, that's a biggie as well. Um, there's normally there's some, some chemicals inside hydraulic oil to uh, minimize the impact of water ingress. Um, but some oils, um, especially sort of food safe oils, hydraulic oils, they are a little bit more prone to water ingress. Once water gets into hydraulic oil, uh, the hydraulic fluid isn't very effective anymore. And obviously the, the best thing you can do is, is just to purge the system and um, to replace the hydraulic fluid in your system. Um, they recommend this on cars as well. And you may, may notice this, that, um, um, that every couple of years you're... Um, it's recommended for your brake fluid to be changed um, to make sure that the braking system works uh, at, its, at its optimum and that any condensation which may have been sort of captured by the brake fluid, that it doesn't sort of affect the performance, uh, providing you change your, uh, your fluid regularly in regular intervals. Okay, uh, we've got mechanical breakdown, which is another uh, problem. Yeah. Again, can be down to contamination, can be down to wear and tear, just normal wear and tear. Um, we've got pressure loss as well, which tends to be down to the pump or leak somewhere in the system. Pump failure, um, normally we've got a secondary pump in, in good hydraulic systems to, um, you know, to, to, to kick in if the first pump, the main pump, goes down. Uh, so we can maintain um, pressure within the system at all times. And then a failure of uh, control units. Uh, so, for example, we've got uh, valves which are operated by solenoids. So we could have a, a problem with the solenoid or we could have a problem with uh, the wiring. Uh, some valves are operated using uh, pneumatic pressure. And uh, if that pressure, if there's a problem with the pressure with the pneumatic system, obviously it's going to affect the hydraulic system as well. So. It's not just a, a matter of looking at um, parts within your system that are operated by hydraulics, but you can also have electrical faults or pneumatic faults as well. Okay, uh, let's move to the next slide. Um, PPM and contamination. So PPM stands for Plant Preventative Maintenance. And let's have a look at contamination. Uh, you can see in the picture here that uh, you've got like a few bits and bobs and there, some are really small, some are bigger. And um, what I used to do, for example, with a car engine, I always used to, to, to you know, for a long time, I had very old cars. And one way to check the oil is, is just to, to take the dipstick and then to run the oil between your fingers. And if you found there was some grittiness in there, so there were some shavings from the engine or some whatever, it was time to change the oil. Now, in hydraulic systems, it's different. Now, a car engine operates at about um, seven bars, round about there. That's the pressure built up inside the engine. An hydraulic system might have pressures going up to about 100 bar or even, even beyond that. So that means that any contamination can be much more dangerous 
and much more aggressive um, than in a car engine. So um, uh, even tiny things in your oil, which you cannot see with your eyes and you cannot feel with your fingers, tiny bits of contaminants can cause a breakdown within your hydraulic system. So an industry figure, and it depends which book you read, it says 80% of breakdowns are due to contamination. Other books say 90%. So it's probably safe to say that between 80 to 90% of all breakdowns within the hydraulic industry is due to contamination. In comparison, uh, we've got, uh, this based on the 80% figure, we've got 10% due to aeration and cavitation. Okay, we did talk about cavitation. i um, not sure which unit it was, but cavitation to do with bubbles, yeah, to do with, um, you know, the oil having um, little bits of air in there and um, it can cause all sorts of problems. The same with aeration as well, pretty much the same th or similar thing. So it can cause a lot of problems and uh, it can cause damage within the system. 5% due to overpressurizing the system. Okay, now systems are made for a certain pressure, yeah. And, um, and the temptation is there to overload the system or to not stick to the pressure, to just increase the pressure a little bit to try and make it more efficient, but uh, you will cut down the lifespan yeah, if you overpressurize. And then we've got 5%, and this is interesting as well. So 5% of all breakdowns are due to bad oil, defective parts, or accidental breakage. And that's normally what you would think is about 95%, you know, that some stuff just, just is defective and goes down, or that it simply breaks, but it's not the case. A lot of it is down to contamination. So if you can control contamination by putting filters in there and by controlling how many contaminants are inside the oil and by replacing the oil in regular intervals, your machinery can last a lot longer and you can increase the, the lifespan of your machinery uh, by many, many years. So um, just bear this in mind, contamination is the biggest issue in hydraulics, and if taken seriously, it is the easiest way to tackle downtime. Yeah? Get contamination down, and your downtime of your machinery is going to go down as well. So there's a direct link to that, and very often the temptation is there. You've got your JCB, and I've seen this sort of in um, when I worked a little bit in agriculture many, many, many years ago, um, that uh, you've got a tractor, the tractor is okay, it runs, you know, it's got some hydraulic parts, some hydraulic systems, there's dirt all over the place, you, you just don't bother, you, you keep going, yeah. and uh, you're not that much um, interested sort of in making sure, you, you know, to, to look after your hydraulics, if they work, they work, if they are broken, you change them. And that sort of is a little bit the mentality, uh, which, which may be found within in hydraulics, um, sort of a, a point of contamination, very easy point of contamination is when uh, if you've got a tractor and you um, hook up your hydraulics to the pump, so you've got your hose, and then you take your gear off and you've got other agriculture, agricultural gear and you plug it back in again, um, every time you plug it in there's um, the chance of contamination uh, through the joint. Yeah? So the joint is a little bit dirty, you plug it in, you know, makes connection, and then the little bit of dirt which is in there is just, uh, got, it's just getting added to the hydraulic oil. Then again, you, you can have filters and you can push your hydraulic oil through filter systems and they can capture most of the, um, most of the uh, contamination, the contaminants. And, um, and again, you can, in, in that way, prevent downtime and protect your equipment. Okay, let's move on. Um, Right. Um, can you tell from from looking at the oil whether it is contaminated? Um, big question. Can you tell whether from looking at the oil whether it is contaminated? And the answer is no. You can't. Yeah. You can't. So when you look at oil, um, the contaminants in there are invisible. Yeah. And we're going to um, look at this in a in a moment. Uh, you've got a couple of pictures here. So we've got new oil from, uh, and we've got these, um, it's an ISO standard. We've got these ranges 22, 20, 18, and then 23, 22, 20. And you can see what it looks like under the microscope. So you see some um, contaminants in there, some particles, and here as well. Um, and here we've got 20, 18, 16. So the, the lower the numbers, the better. And you can see the particles in here. And then we've got... Um, something with beta filtration, there's virtually nothing in there. Yeah. 
can see a little thing here and a little, little thing there. And the numbers are fairly large. So we've got 14, 13, 11. I'm going to show in a minute what these numbers stand for. Yeah. So, um, so we can see these are the contaminants. They are destroying our equipment slowly but surely. Um, if I've got good filtration, for example, this beta filtration, um, I can get the level of contaminants right down and I don't have to worry that much about my equipment. So it's important to have good filtration. And that's something you can do with ease. And um, it's not that expensive. It's certainly cheaper than having to replace your whole hydraulic system, um, you know, a few years prematurely. Okay. Let's go back. So let's have a look at the size of bacteria. You all know you can't see bacteria. Yeah. And we've got a scale here. Uh, this is a millimeter, and uh, the eye can see up to about uh, two, two hundredths of a millimeter. Is this right? It's not right. It's not two hundredths. It's uh, a twentieth a twentieth of a millimeter, not a two hundredths. Yeah. So two hundred micrometers or two hundred microns. That's what an eye can see. That's sort of the tiniest speck of dust you can possibly see with your eye. Yeah. Um, then up to about one micrometer, you have to use a live microscope. And if you go below one micron or one micrometer, or a lot below, um, then you have to use an uh, electron microscope. Yeah. So when we look at bacteria, bacteria are somewhere between one micrometer to about four or five micrometers. Yeah. We can't see bacteria. You need a microscope. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you've done it in biology, so you can see um, a bacteria in the microscope. And um, yeah, that's it. Yeah. So anyway, let's have a look at, at this stuff, which is going to screw up our hydraulic system. Uh, I've got him here. Yeah, here we go. Um, okay, four to five microns, one to five, five microns. Yeah, that's um, the size of a bacteria. And here we've got anti-friction bearings, and the clearance is 0.5 microns. So it's about half the size of a bacteria. Uh, then we've got a vein pump, yeah, the vein tip to outer ring. It's between 0.5 and 1 micron. So it's just the size of a bacteria. So that means um, it's so tight that even a bacteria would get crushed. The average bacteria would get crushed if the vein pump goes, goes past it. So you can see there's hardly any clearing whatsoever. So if you've got like a, uh, some... Um, filings which are in your oil, some metal filings, and they get caught up with the uh, vein pump, uh, it'll cause damage to the pump and you, you'd start getting massive leakage. We've got a gear pump and it's 0.5 to 5 microns. Yeah, so um, again, bacteria is about 5 microns. They are the big fat bacteria. The smaller ones are 1 micron. Servo valves, 1 to 4 microns. Hydrostatic bearing, bearings, 1 to 25 microns. Okay, we have a little bit more space here, you know, but it still starts at um, at, uh, at the size of a bacteria, and then it goes a little bit bigger. And then piston pump, we've got between 5 and 40 microns. Servo valves, flapper wall, between 18 and 63 microns. Actuators, between 50 and 250 microns. Okay, so here we uh, have got a little bit more generosity with the act actuators. And we've got uh, servo valves, orifice, which is between 130 and 450 microns. Still very, 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 very tiny. So 450 microns um, could probably just, it's just like a speck of dust or something. So that's quite big. But, but always bear in mind, we've got pumps, uh, anti-friction bearings, hydrostatic bearings. Yeah, they're all in our system. And, and they start off with clearances of, of the size of a bacteria. So that means if you've got contaminants, which are bigger than a bacteria, they can cause a lot of problems to your system and they can make your system um, suffer. Okay, move on. What happens if you can actually see the contaminants in the oil? So I've got a little bit of oil here in this picture. And this is sort of really bad oil. It's picked up a lot of contaminants They're all over the place. And, um, and again, just think about it. Yeah, You've got clearances which are, which are smaller, or even just the size of a bacteria, or a little bit bigger than a bacteria, in some parts of your hydraulic system. So these are the clearances. Then you've got bits here which are clearly several millimeters in size, and they get caught up with, with those clearances. And potentially they could destroy uh, cylinder walls or uh, cylinders themselves or pistons. 
they could destroy seals and um, and and pumps. Yeah, vein pumps. The veins could be destroyed. Um, you could create blockages as well. So if you've got too too many of them, they might just sort of congest and you get a blockage. And once you get a blockage, you get a pressure build up, and the pressure eventually is going to try and force it through. But um, but yeah, it's a big problem. Yeah. Big massive problem. Okay, um, let's move on. Right, we've got a typical uh, hydraulic system you can see here. So we've got our, uh, let me use a mouse here so you can follow me. We've got our um, um, pump, yeah, you can see the pump here. We've got uh, the tank as well. We've got some oil which is piped into, into the system. And, um, and here we've got all the different sources of contamination which are, which are sort of taking place in a typical system. So number one is we've got initial oil contamination. So when the oil comes from the, from the shop yeah, and it's fresh, it's new, there's contamination there already. How does this contamination get in? First of all, there might be some corrosion in the container. So they've got some drums. The drums may not be 100% before they were filled up. There might have been a little bit of corrosion in them. So you might get tiny rust particles in the oil. Um, and always bear in mind, we are not talking about big chunky bits, but we are just talking about um, materials the size of a bacteria or a couple of bacteria. You know, stuff you cannot see with your eyes. Okay, then you start pumping the oil into the tank. Yeah? So that's another source of contamination. Uh, is your pump okay? Is it fine? Yeah. Uh, then you've got wear and tear in your equipment. So we've got, you know, pumps, actuators, and so on. Uh, there's wear and tear. Little bits get shaved off and they enter the oil. Uh, then we do repairs. We take things apart. We obviously clean it all very nicely. Uh, but the problem is that um, the contamination is at microscopic level. So we clean it all up with a piece of cloth. And, you know, we have made the valve really pretty and shiny and everything seems to be very, very neat and clean. But is it? Yeah. It is due, you know, down to the level you can see, but it's not down to the level you, you cannot see. Yeah. So, so again, another source of contamination. Uh, we've got pistons, yeah. so the pistons have got seals, um, but again, the seals have got tiny clearances, and even though the, the oil may not get through, uh, the piston may pick up contaminants the size of bacteria, which, which enter the oil. Uh, then we've got valves, yeah. so valves again, wear and tear, and um, and then whenever the system is opened, you know, we, we may have external contamination taking place. And always bear in mind, it's not just necessarily the stuff you see, but it's also the stuff you can't see, which enters the circuit. So what can we do about this contamination? Let me ask you this question. What can we do? What's the only effective way to deal with contamination? I'll give you a little trick. We, we apply the same concept, the same technology in our cars. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to carry on. Uh, the only way, the only thing what we can do is, is we need to add filters into the oil circuit. We've got a, an oil filter in the car. It's the most important thing. If you do an oil change, you must make sure that you change the filter because all the grime and all the rubbish uh, will be caught up in the filter. And if you haven't got time to do an oil change or something, um, or, you know, you can't go to the garage or whatever and, and you've got a long journey and you just can't do it. Just stick a new filter on. Uh, on some cars, it's very easy to do. But, but that's very, very important. The filters are very, very important. In an hydraulic system, extremely important. And there are different types of filters. We're going to look at them in a minute. Okay. Okay, just a couple of facts. Um, ISO 4406, okay. That's the ISO that deals with contamination levels in hydraulic oils. So that's ISO 4406. Um, just to let you know that there is uh, an international standards organization standard yeah, that deals with all this. And bacteria, again, just to reiterate, has got a size of 5 microns and a clearance vein for pumps, for, for vein pumps, clearance for vein pumps is 5 microns. 80% uh, of breakdowns in hydraulic systems are due to contamination, as we mentioned it before. Contamination in oil cannot be seen without a microscope. 
And automatic particle counters are available for an ongoing check of particles in the oil above 4, 6, and 14 microns. Okay. You remember when we looked at those figures, when... Uh, let me just go back to the slide. Um, I'm just going to go back uh, to... A slide. This this is a slide. And you see those figures here: 22, 2018, 23, 22, 20, 14, 13, 11. So these are the slides, yeah? and they determine the cleanliness of the oil and uh, what you can use the oil for and the grade of the oil. And so what they do is so they look at particles the size of four microns, the size of six microns, and the size of 14 microns, and they start counting them. And then based on that, they can grade the oil and they can say, right, if I've got for a certain amount of oil more than X amount of particles, um, then the oil has got to be rejected and it's, it needs, needs changing. Yeah. And uh, you get companies to do this for you. There's, there's one company, we had a presentation here at the college some time ago from Finning, and, um, and they do this stuff. Yeah. They, you can send in your oil sample, even you know, for your car, I think it costs about 10, 15 quid or something. Um, and they'll analyze the oil and they'll give you a response. They'll let you know whether the engine is good or not or is likely to get on very soon. And they can tell all this stuff from the oil, you know, based on the contaminants which are in the oil. And obviously you can do this for hydraulic systems, for industrial systems as well. Okay, move on. How to minimize contamination levels? The answer is uh, con contamination. First of all, what is contamination? We've got heat, water, dirt and metals. Um, so you get those figures here, 70 to 90 percent of failure due to contamination, 10 to 30 percent due to misuse, defects, and age. And, um, and so we get all these bits ending up in our oil, causing lots of problems, and we need a filtration system to try and get them out. And that's what it's really all about. So we've got filters. We control the operating pressure. Um, there may be hose pipe issues as well, so if you change your hose pipes regularly, every time you, um, you know, connect the hose pipe maybe from one pump to another or like in agricultural systems when you, uh, uh, you, know, you hook something up to your tractor and then you hook something else up to your tractor and you may have to change the hydraulic hose pipes, every time you plug them in there's a chance of contamination um, getting into the oil, especially in dirt environments. Um, right, uh, quality of hydraulic oils, very, very important. Uh, if you, and again, you know, the oil may look good and, and it feel, might feel good, so if you run it between your fingers, fingers you might not get any, any grit or anything like that, but um, it, uh, it, it still is not good yeah, because the, the contaminants are down to a microscopic level. Uh, we've got oil storage, which may be a problem. You know, the way the oil is stored, that it can pick up contaminants. Uh, the tank system, so if it's an open tank and it's not proper, properly sealed, so contaminants can get into the tank and get pushed around the system. We've got air breathers, cylinder rods and seals, so uh, even though oil may not penetrate through the seal, contaminants might still get through. And then poor maintenance procedures as well. So if, you know, there's this term, cleanliness is next to godliness. And I think in hydraulic systems, it's similar. I mean, we know, for example, that surgeons are um, extremely clean, and they know if they are not clean, if they don't keep up a routine of, of hygiene, and they operate on a patient, there's a good chance that the patient will get a bad infection and die. An hydraulic system is, is actually quite similar. If you don't operate in very clean um, environments when you take a valve apart or when you try to repair hydraulic uh, components, maybe fit new seals or something, if you don't do it in a super clean environment, um, you may introduce contaminants, <clears throat> which in time will destroy the system. Um, so <coughs> it's very important to, to encourage a regime of cleanliness uh, for people who work on hydraulics. Uh, poor maintenance procedures, poor components as well. So if the components are uh, not up to standard um, and they start wearing down fairly fast, whenever they wear, you get shavings, and these shavings get into the system and gradually destroy the system. Okay, common system faults. Um, we're going to go away a little bit from 
the contamination issue, even though, you know, 80% of the issue is contamination. Uh, so we've got uh, hoses, which is bent, size twist. Yeah. So how are they bent? You know, have you got a strong bend? Are they twisted? Um, there's a figure which I, I read, which was that uh, the lifespan of a hose, which is twisted, hydraulic hose, is going to be reduced by about 90%. Yeah. So if it lasts a year, uh, for example, if it lasts 10 years, It'll only, you know, it'll go down after about a year, you know, with the pressure that that's, um, you know, put into it. Um, pump performance, lack of pressure, leakage, failure. So again, we're looking at cavitation, you know, if, if it doesn't pick up oil and sucks in air as well. Um, we've got uh, maybe leakage inside the pump, possibly failure. So this can be a fault and cause other faults. Uh, mechanical fatigue, particles released into the system. Okay, that's one big problem. Blockages, uh, water contamination. So that doesn't mean that the water is contaminated, but the water contaminates the hydraulic fluid. Yeah, so that's uh, uh, an issue as well. Um, once water is in hydraulic fluid, it, it generates corrosion. Corrosion in turn generates uh, small particles which flow through the system. If they don't get filtered out, it'll destroy the hydraulics. Fluid levels, if they're not up to date, so simple fault if it sucks in air and the fluid level in the tank is too low maybe there's been a repair nobody noticed it and suddenly the system starts behaving erratically it could be that the fluid level is low so all you need to do is just fill up the tank with um, with hydraulic oil there could be airlocks aeration and cavitation um, it's always a nightmare when you've got brakes when you work on your brakes you've got um, an airlock somewhere in there uh, and basically means you have to start pumping your pedal to get some real performance and the only way to get them out is just to uh, push all the hydraulic fluid through until the uh, airlocks get out the other side um, right heat degradation and failing filtration failing filtration again is a biggie so uh, causes all sorts of other problems Okay, hose pipe issues so you've got incorrect sizes so the problem can be that you use um, that you've got an hydraulic system and you increase the pressure to a level the hose pipes are not made for. So they will go down quite early and uh, below their, their lifespan. Incorrect rate for the pressure it is supposed to handle. Okay, so there are different types of hose pipes. Uh, they all have got some sort of wire mesh inside to try and add some stability to them. And, and if the um, hose size is the hose pipe is not um, is is not the correct size. Uh, what you find is it'll first of all the system is not going to operate at top performance, and um, and also the the pipe is gonna uh, gonna go down quite quite fast. Uh, next one is incorrect connectors. If you have incorrect connectors, they are pretty much all standardized. Uh, the good chance is they just won't work. You won't be able to connect them. So you have to make sure, obviously, you get the pipes with the correct connect connectors. We talked about twists, which reduce the life cycle by about 90%. Sharp bends, which reduce the flow and also the life cycle. And then we've got abrasion, uh, which um, you know can cause fuel injection injury. So you've got a pipe, the pipe rubs against a piece of metal, and then over time it just gets thinner and thinner, and eventually the pressure is just going to blow it up. So when you look at hydraulic systems, especially on mobile devices, you know, like a tractor or a JCB or something, um, make sure that the hose pipes don't rub against something. And, and also, if they do, or if there's a chance that they might rub against something, have regular inspections. And if you get some wear and tear on the pipes, be sure to uh, swap them out in time before they blow up. Okay, um, we've got... Seven of the most common faults which you may find in hydraulic systems. Um, the first one is the hydraulic power pack. Uh, so we've got, um, we're going to look at this in a minute. The hydraulic power pack is everything is in there. It's two pumps, a tank, gauges. We've got a couple of valves as well, you know, over pressure valve and so on. We've got pumps in general, accumulators, are very, very dangerous devices. And then we've got actuators, jerking valves, leaky valves. Um, and stuck valves as well. So we're going to look at all these in detail now. Okay, the hydraulic power pack, you can see one here. So you've got a pump, you've got a backup pump, uh, you've got a tank, 
you've got some gauges and so on. So um, these are all the things which can go wrong with an hydraulic power pack. Um, one of them is the signal receiver can go faulty, so that's maybe an electrical problem. Uh, tank levels may not be indicated properly. You get um, a faulty pump, uh, faulty level gauges, so which may cause a shutdown. Uh, we've got uh, uh, faulty pressure gauges as well, so they may, you know, show zero or go too high. And uh, with safety features, they might take the system down. And then uh, we may have uh, false alarms due to faulty, faulty sensors as well, you know, in the in the hydraulic power pack. And then obviously we've got a filter as well in the power pack. Very, very important. Um, and I think sort of the awareness over the years has sort of gone up a lot more than what it used to be in olden days. Uh, anyway, if your filter's clogged up, then it could potentially be a problem and you, you need to change it. Pumps. Okay, pumps, um, they can have a mechanical failure. Uh, and again, they're fairly straightforward. You've got a shaft. The shaft is driven by either an electric motor or... Uh, a combustion engine or something. Um, you then have got oil in and oil out. Uh, you generate the oil pressure. And um, and so you might have problems with the controlled circuit, what either is driving the shaft. And then obviously the stuff inside the pump can go wrong as well. Um, so indicators that the pump has gone down, nothing works. There's excessive heat generated around the pump. So that could be an electrical fault if there's an electric motor where you know, some windings have burned out or something. And and it's noisy as well. It can be noisy. Yeah. So, for example, it's, uh, it's just a mechanical device. So we've got bearings in here. Uh, we have got, um, you know, some stuff that is pumped in. So if there's some solids which got into the oil circuit and got into the pump, it might uh, clog it up. Um, so it could be contamination. Yeah. Or it could just uh, be one of the other things. They're fairly sturdy, though, and um, and fairly good. If pumps are getting noisy, that's normally an indicator that there may be a problem with the bearings. Once the bearings go, the, the seal is soon to follow, and, and it's time to change the pump. Okay. Accumulators. Uh, so you've got the... We talked about this before, and you've got a, something that's going to be compressed and generates pressure. No... You cannot compress oil, you cannot compress uh, water, uh, but you can compress air. And so what's happening here is we've got a, a bladder filled with nitrogen. So you can see this, uh, for example, here. And then the oil uh, builds up pressure, and this pressure is stored in this ball. So if there is um, a sudden release of oil, instead of having a pressure drop, the pressure is maintained through the accumulator. So accum accumulators are very important for the circuit. Anyway, what can happen with an accumulator? So the bladder can burst. Yeah, it's, it's just like a mechanical device. It gets, um, you know, squeezed and unsqueezed, and eventually it'll it'll go down. Yeah, and once the bladder breaks, uh, pressure cannot be generated. We may have aeration and cavitation as a result. Bear in mind, there's uh, nitrogen in there most likely. Um, and, uh, and one way to see what's going on is just maybe just to have a pressure gauge to see what is the pressure buildup, does it maintain the pressure, you know, how does it all work. Um, it's one way to do this, yeah. And, and again, if you ever work on an accumulator, you must make sure that they're depressurized, even if you think they're broken. You may have a, a, a wrong diagnostic, a wrong analysis, and the thing may still be okay. You shut it off. You, uh, you know, put your spanners on and you take a charged accumulator off the circuit. And um, uh, you have to be so careful. You know, if all the energy is released in one go, it um, could take the accumulator through the roof or, you know, turn it into a missile. So, again, very, very careful. They have to be depressurized whenever you work on them. Okay, so we've got actuators. Now, actuators can be pistons. We've got some pistons here. There can be levers, there can be um, um, yeah, lots of other stuff as well. So anyway, uh, for actuators, we need to check the control lines and signals for the actuator. So an actuator can be uh, operated electrically. Yeah? So you might have a solenoid stuck on there. I'm just looking at some of them here. This one looks like it's got a solenoid on there. So it could be an electrical fault on, on there. So the power is generated through the hydraulics but the signal is given through uh, a solenoid, which opens up the piston or closes it. Um, it could be pneumatics as well. Yeah. I'm just trying to look um, which of these could be pneumatic. Or it could be oil-operated. Yeah. So instead of 
controlling the actuator and you just provide the oil pressure, you control the oil pressure or a little valve with oil pressure to move the actuator forward or backward. Uh, so again, that could be one of them. It could just simply be a mechanical failure, could be a broken seal. So if it's a broken seal somewhere, you should have some oil leakage or pre pressure loss at least. Uh, it could be a pump problem. So if, if you suspect it's a pump problem, change the standby pump. And if the problem is fixed, then you know the pump is down and you put another pump in. It could be an electrical problem, so you check the contacts, you look for low voltages. Normal voltages for hydraulic systems tend to be 24 volts. Yeah? So if suddenly you get about 16, 15 volts, um, it may suggest that, that, that something is wrong on your, uh, on your, your electrical lines. Uh, could be a broken circuit. Yeah. Okay, oil levels still low, so it could be a case as well that um, the levels are not enough and that air got into the system. Uh, again, you can rectify it and you can sort of check it out fairly easily. Okay, clocked circuit affecting actu actuators. Uh, foreign substances in, in the hydraulic circuit could be in there, so you check for pressure to identify the blockage. Uh, impurities could be bad oil, yeah. burst filter cartridge, there's no more filtering action taking place, so if they burst, and again, it's, it's not that unlikely considering the pressures you're dealing with. Um, so if easy thing, you just you know swap the filter out. And you have to bear in mind that once the filter bursts, that a lot of dirt and grime and particulates are going to be released back into the oil. So there might be an argument to stick a new filter in. And even if the filter is supposed to last for X amount of hours to uh, change it very, very, very quickly, you know once it's captured all the stuff the previous filter has released. Uh, failed flushing operation, so you flush the system and you didn't have a good flush. Um, and some stuff was still left in the system, so that's an indicator that the system is being clogged. Solution, clear blockages, remove affected pipes, valve, valves, actuators, and clean and flush the whole system. Okay, uh, we've got a jerking valve operation uh, caused by pressure, pressure surge, air in the system, 40 accumulator, 40 actuator. And you can see this is a typical valve, what they look like. Um, so move from one side to the other, and so stuff is, uh, the oil is moved one way or the other way. Again, if you've got something like that, if you've got a pressure surge, um, the best thing is, is to purge the system. So you flush the oil out, put new oil in, and then try to maintain the pressure at the same level, and then check and change accumulator or faulty actuator, yeah, if there's a problem like that. The valve does not shut fully. Could be another problem. So again, this could be caused by an internal leakage of the actuator. Um, it could be low oil, pre low oil pressure. Um, or it could be a problem in the relief and check valve. Yeah? So for example, if the relief valve is set too low, the oil pressure is going to go too low as well. And it may not be enough pressure to operate the valve successfully. Or the valve you know, operates too slowly and uh, you don't get the action which you require. So you check pressure is adequate and stable in the system. And, and this is sort of an argument that you try, if you build or design a system yourself, that you try and have pressure gauges all over the system uh, to get a good idea of what's, what's going on in, in the hydraulic system. Ensure relief and check valves are working. And check the operating time of the valve against recommended settings. And I mean, obviously, if you work a machine, if you've got a JCB, and you are used to a certain responsiveness of the system, if suddenly this, this responsiveness has gone, then um, you, um, um, you know, you know something is wrong here and needs fixing. Uh, but obviously, if you just come as an engineer from the outside, as a JCB truck, they tell you, oh, it don't work, fix it. Um, and then all you can do is you can go by data sheets of what the response time should be or experience. Uh, the valve is not moving, it's stuck completely. And it can be an electrical problem, so it could be a broken solenoid or dirty contacts or loose wires. So if it's an, got an electrical control unit or controlled circuit, that's the first one I would check. You know, is, is the signal arriving at the, um, at the solenoid? And if it is, you know, just clean the contacts, stick it back on again. Bear in mind that solenoids, they, they gobble up a lot of current. And even though you may have all the voltages, if the contacts are not squeaky clean, uh, it may not be capable of um, 
of pushing the current through. It just behaves like a, like a resistor. And if that is the case, you don't get your three, four amps or whatever the solenoid needs to operate. And, um, and then, um, then the valve won't work. It's an hydraulic valve. You always get a little bit of seepage and there's tends to be oil all over the place uh, very often. And all it needs is just like a little bit of seepage, you know, and, and oil is like an insulator um, going between the contacts and it might, might do it all. So the best thing is, is just uh, take the contacts apart, you know, clean it all up really, really well, you know, get some anti-degreasant and, um, and everything should be, should be fine. Yeah. So that's just one way of, of dealing with it. Okay. Um, What else? Check pipes for leakages. So if maybe the pressure buildup isn't there, the oil doesn't go to um, to to the uh, to the valve. Then check the actuator itself. Check the valve, um, and you can take them apart, and and you can very often tell quite a lot. You know whether uh, there's a problem or not. It might just be a seal or something else which is broken. Okay, number 25, we're almost done here. Why is it necessary to isolate the hydraulic circuit before working on it? And we, we sort of talked about this before, but we need to reiterate this in this presentation as well. Uh, you never work on live hydraulic circuits. It could be lethal to you. The pressures are so high that they could kill you. I wouldn't say they could slice you in half, but they could uh, cause an oil injection injury, and this injury could uh, uh, lead to amputation, lead to blood poisoning, lead to sepsis and uh, necrosis is going to happen anyway but you have to minimize uh, necrosis as much as possible so necrosis is that your fat tissue your cells in your body are going to be destroyed with uh, an oil injection injury so you need to get the stuff out as soon as possible um, <clears throat> so number one is a couple of rules here seven rules never work on pressurized system systems uh, a sudden release of pressure can be fatal. So again, we talked about the accumulator. And if you um, take off the accumulator from an hydraulic system whilst it's charged up, and you then release the pressure, uh, that thing can turn into a missile, and it can take you with it. It can kill you. And, and it's not unheard of um, to um, you know, people who were not understanding how accumulators work, uh, getting killed in the process of, of swapping them, changing them. So again, you have to be very, very careful with, with pressurized systems. Uh, equipment can be destroyed if not depressurized in the correct way. Very, very important as well. So you turn the pump off, you depressurize the system, you let everything go back to tank you know, uh, in your hydraulic system. You uh, open up all the valves, you know, make sure that everything can leak out. Uh, you monitor all your pressure gauges to make sure that, that there's no residual pressure left anywhere in the system. A trick as well is this, you just open and shut your valves a few times to uh, ensure that any, any little bit of residual pressure which is there is released. Is, um, and then the next question is why isolate the hydraulic circuit? And it's the same as what we've done in, in electrical engineering, uh, that you have uh, a log off, tack off. Yeah? You have to make sure that nobody, you're just working on a, for example, on a, on, a, on a production line, and you're changing something on the hydraulics. Somebody else might come along and say, why doesn't it work? Why is the line standing still? Just turn on the hydraulics, and whilst you're working on it, you suddenly get uh, oil at a pressure of about uh, 100 bars squeezing out of uh, a pipe, um, and, and not just dousing you, but uh, potentially causing serious injury as well. Um, Okay, a couple of tricks as well. Uh, on, uh, number five, first of all, stored energy may cause actuators to move whilst working on them. So if there's still some stored energy, for example, you've got a press of, or something, you're working underneath the press, and, um, and you think nothing should you know, operate or work uh, because it's depressurized and the system is... Uh, not operating, but there might still be some pressure left somewhere in the system. And whilst you open a valve or release a valve, a press might move down or an actuator, a lever, uh, whatever it may be, might just come down and, um, um, you know, cause injury to you. So you have to be very careful when, whenever you're working on hydraulic equipment and be aware, be alert of, of these potential dangers. 
Um, a little thing as well, a little trick. So if you're on a hydraulic system and it's difficult and dangerous to undo nuts and bolts of a pressurized system. So if you find there's quite a lot of resistance, so you've got your, your, um, your torque wrench and um, you now it's been torqued up to a certain amount yeah, and you try to uh, undo it using pretty much the same amount or possibly a slightly bit more, but it's not possible there's a good chance that the system is still pressurized. So you have to make sure that you get rid of the pressure and, um, and, and don't force it, otherwise um, you might cause a huge problem yeah, as the seals are released. Yeah. It might destroy the seals, it might um, give you an injection injury, it um, might dose you in oil, yeah. whatever it may be, but, but just be very, very careful. Um, and it's regulations as well. So you need to isolate an hydraulic circuit before working on it. So you always should, um, you always should make sure that you stick to regulations. Okay. Uh, a couple of more slides and then we are done. Uh, we are still within the hour. Yeah. A procedure to release stored energy. Uh, many believe that once a hydraulic system is uh, shut down, it is safe to perform maintenance on the machine. But well, many don't know that it's that even though the hydraulic pump is stopped or machine is disconnected, the system is still under high pressure. Okay, so that's uh, what you have to be aware of, and I think the point has been made several times over. Uh, to release stored energy, this is what you need to do: is you check the pres pressure gauges, you stop the pump, you open the relief valves and release valves. Uh, use the pump as a pressure relief tool as possible. So some pumps they are bidirectional, so you can try and pump everything back into a tank. Um, ensure all equipment is shut down properly. Uh, all race components are moved to the lowest level. Lock out hydraulic pressure systems if possible. Check pressure gauges have gone to zero. Yeah, that's pretty much the way to do it. Um, again, you have to make sure that uh, everything is up to scratch and has been done properly. Right, questions. Um, I think this is the last slide, is it? It is. Uh, what causes 80% of all hydraulic breakdowns? I'm just going to wait for a moment. Yeah, the answer is uh, it's right, it's contaminations. How much bigger are contaminants compared to bacteria? So, what do you remember from the presentation? Okay, um, so contaminants, the lowest contaminants are about the same size as bacteria, average bacteria. One bacteria is about one to five micron. Um, contaminants, obviously, they can you know, be as big as umpteen millimeters, but um, the contaminants we are worried about, they, they start at about half a micron to a micron, and, and it's about the same size. Next question. You have established that a valve has failed and needs replacing. What is the first action you would do before removing the faulty valve? Yeah, I'm going to give you a moment. Okay. You should, obviously, you should um, depressurize the system. That should be the, the first action. And then make sure that it actually is depressurized and that there's no residual pressure by you know, operating valves and opening them up whilst the pump is not working to allow the, the, the oil to drain back to tank. Um, next question. What happens if you over torque a nut on a hydraulic system? Okay. Right. Um, when you over torque, it um, obviously all nuts and bolts um, in a hydraulic system they are torqued up, so you've got a torque wrench. If you over torque them, it can potentially destroy the seals, and it can have a, a counter counterproductive effect. Can be counterproductive. So instead of uh, you know sealing it better, you're actually sealing it worse, and you might have little gaps where uh, the hydraulic oil can seep out. Uh, other than that, you might uh, thread your um, your nuts and bolts, and um, um, then obviously they won't 
they won't work at all. Uh, right, why are accumulators really dangerous? Just a moment, give you some time to think about it. Okay, so they can contain residual pressure. So if you uh, turn off the valve at the bottom of the accumulator or the entrance of the accumulator and you remove it and it's still pressurized, it's a very dangerous piece of equipment, can turn into a missile and can cause a huge amount of damage. Well, what action would you take if you suspect an air ingress into an hydraulic system? So I'll let you think about it for a moment. Air gets into an hydraulic system. So we've got aeration and cavitation. Okay, what would you do? And yes. <coughs> uh, you would purge the system, yeah. You would purge the system. Uh, you notice excessive heat in part of your hydraulic system. What could be the cause? Okay, something might be faulty. Uh, there's some sort of resistance. Uh, when you put energy into a system and there's a resistance to overcome, so it could be a leak of some sort or another, uh, heat is generated as a byproduct. Yeah. So if um, the energy cannot be translated into torque, for example, like an hydraulic motor, it'll turn into heat. Basically, it's a problem. Yeah. Uh, what type of problems could a broken seal cause? Okay, so uh, first of all, uh, it could um, generate seepage, yeah, so oil leaks out. Um, so we would have a pressure loss, so that's one thing. And then obviously there's a health and safety aspect as well, that it could cause injection injury, we've got to be losing oil, it's got to be contamination of the environment, and so on. Um, but um, the biggest issue is that the hydraulic system is not going to last very long. So if a seal is broken, we need to change it as fast as possible. Uh, why is stored energy an issue? And we, we're looking for two reasons. Okay, so the, obviously the first reason is uh, stored energy <coughs> can be released at times when we don't want it to be released. Yeah? So uh, we need to be aware of that, of accumulators. So if we did pressurize an hydraulic system, uh, the accumulator valve needs to be in the um, in the open position, yeah. So for the oil to leak out of the accumulator back into tank, so that's very very important, and that's um, that's that's one. And the other one is um, is just health and safety uh, as well. Uh, so if you take it off, and I mentioned this umpteen times, I'm going to mention it again because it's important. If you take it off, it uh, could cause a huge huge amount of problems. So uh, we have uh, big problems here in this system. And, um, and that's pretty much the end of the, the presentation. It's, I think it's just about an hour we have, we have done. OK, uh, I'm just going to sum up. Um, there are quite a lot of faults in a hydraulic system. The biggest issue is contamination. Yeah. Uh, and uh, then obviously, we've got other stuff as well, you know, wear and tear, fatigue of the system, and so on. Uh, but combination, c contamination is the biggest one. Uh, the best way to deal with that is filtering. There are very um, good filtering systems around now. Uh, one of the best filters is a beta filter, uh, which can keep the oil very, very clean. Contamination starts from buying the oil yeah, from out of the drum uh, to all the way, you know, filling up the system. And it's, it's just part of life. It's a bit um, something that's inevitable. But um, the more we control it, the, long, the more we control it, the better we control it the longer our system is uh, going to last. 
Okay, uh, thank you very much for tuning into this presentation. Um, that pretty much concludes what you need to know about hydraulics. Again, we are just uh, covering the, the main aspects. Um, for the assignment, you will have to change your valve and you have to find a fault. We had a look at fault finding, we covered the theory. And uh, when you do the practical, we're going to give you some pointers as well, what to look out for. Obviously, the systems we have are not quite as complex as what you would find in industry. But um, they give you a good idea of how hydraulics work. And, and again, the, the main thing is a lot, of, um, a lot of it you will sort of learn through experience uh, working on hydraulics, which, which obviously we can't give you here. But um, we can give you some pointers. And one of the biggest pointers is to what to look out for and, and the dangerous bits in a hydraulic system and, and also the most common causes of things to go down. And once you understand this, you can um, be far more effective working on these systems uh, than otherwise. Okay, thank you for, for checking out this presentation and uh, have, a, have a great day.